just we just want to praise you with everything we do, every breath, Lord. And I pray that each individual will receive that today. Lord, and through the power of your spirit, you will help us receive the message that you have planted into our pastor, Lord. We thank you for him. We lift him up to you. We lift our hearts to you, Lord. Pray that you would just be with us during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, and the church said, Amen. 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 You guys are welcome to be seated. In John chapter 17, we have a prayer that is recorded in our scripture that, that lets us know Jesus' heart and vision for us as a church today. John chapter 17, beginning in verse 20. This is what we read. Jesus says, I'm praying for not only these disciples, but for all who will ever believe in me through their message. So if you believe in Jesus, I want you to look at somebody and say, he's talking about me. And, and if that person next to you said, he's talking about me, then you can say, he's talking about us. Amen. That's what the scripture says. Amen? Amen. He says, for all who will believe in me. And this is part of the prayer. And this leads us right into the message for the day. Jesus says, I pray that they will all be one, not in a bunch of chairs scattered out all over the sanctuary. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm praising God because this is the fullest house we've had so far. Amen. Can we just say thank you, Lord. We are coming back. <clears throat> we are coming back. And I want to welcome all of you, and I want to welcome those of you that are following online and in part of our online service here. We are grateful for you, and we are grateful to be here with you. Jesus says that they all will be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. Now, think of the incredible responsibility and opportunity that that presents to us. A few weeks ago, we talked about how God led the nation of Israel across the, the Jordan River, and he done a miraculous thing there. What he done was he parted the waters, kind of like he did the Red Sea with the Jordan. He stopped the waters, he, and he let all the waters run off, and they walked across that out of the banks because it was a harvest season, or that season for that river to be flowing out of its banks, and they walked across on dry ground. And the Lord said, get one leader from every tribe, 12 men, and get them to pick up one stone and carry them over here to this another city and set up a memorial. Because I want people to forevermore be able to, to be reminded of what I've done for you that day. They set up a memorial. But we took that scripture and we come into the New Testament. We looked at scriptures like this right here where Jesus is saying, I'm not trying to pile up a big pile of stones over here. I'm not worried about rocks no more. I want, and it's my vision, my mission, if God's plan is carried out in our lives today, people are going to look at us and they're going to say, my God, what? is going on. That is supernatural. What a miracle has taken place in that person's life. And specifically, in this part of Jesus' prayer, he says that the world will know Amen. that God exists, that there's a Father in heaven, that the Holy Spirit is working and empowering today, and he's going to know that because everybody's going to be as one. Amen. He's talking to us. That's the vision of the church. Unity. It's interesting times that we are in. Would you agree? Amen. Just a few months ago, everything seemed kind of halfway normal. Then I got a phone call. Kids are out of school. Everybody's coming home. As things continue, this pandemic, COVID-19, coronavirus, has killed over 100,000 people in our country. The economy has been... I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's almost shut down. Millions of people sent home from their jobs. Markets in different areas have crashed. And then just about the time, it felt like things were going to begin to go back towards some sense of, I, hate, I hesitate to use the word normal because we don't have a normal anymore, amen? But things were about to kind of get back to the way they were in some ways, then... This incredible tragedy takes place in our country where a man's life, a man lost his life at the hands of a police officer. And now we are in turmoil. It is an incredible opportunity for a racial divide. 
for separation, for tension, and it mounds every day. That's where we're going today. Because Jesus said, again, that this is my prayer. And this is how the world's going to know that I exist, that God sent me, that God exists, is that they will all be one. Jesus' prayer is a prayer of unity, and today we're going to talk about this. How can we be a part of the solution? So encourage someone around you, say, be a part of the solution. That was very weak. I said encourage someone. Don't warn them. That, that, that sounded more like a warning. Yeah, be, a, be a part of the solution. <laughs> Not sure what's coming here. This is going to be incredibly, incredibly encouraging. It's, just, it's my assumption that you have come here seeking and searching for not only the real issue that might be going on in your life, but the solution to that issue. I mean, we do that in other areas, right? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I suspect that many of you, even over this last year, have maybe went to a doctor's office seeking and searching for what the real issue is and so that maybe a solution can be determined. Sort of like in my line of work before I surrendered to the call of ministry uh, as, a, as an automotive mechanic. That was part of my job was to help people to know this is what the problem is and this is what it's going to take to solve it. And, and a lot of, and, and similarly guys, that's why we come to church is because we have issues. Raise your hand if you have issues. I got issues. There's two kind of people. There's people that say, I have issues, and there's people that are just lying, okay? That's bottom line. They're just in denial. You know, so some of these kids, they don't realize it yet, but all they got to do is just look at us. We can tell them, right? Y'all, y'all, you got issues. You know, so, so that's the reality, and that's why we're here. Now, it, I, I need to go ahead and, and take care of some, I'm going to call this my disclaimer, because I'm about to tackle something that makes me nervous. I'm about to attempt to communicate to you as the Lord has been communicating to me through his word and through experiences and through other people. Uh, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to dive into this racism issue. But I need you to know right up front that I'm not coming at you as an expert. I'm not coming at you as one that has been so far removed from racism that I, not, not, that I can now look back and say, hey, be like me. I've told you before, and I'll, I'll remind you again, I can't be everything, but what I can do and what I commit to is that I can be real. And I'm going to be real. I'm going to work hard to the best of my ability to be real. So I am one, just like you. I raise, I raise both hands. I'm messed up. I've got issues. And I'm on a journey. Can we just journey together? Can we just do that? Can we just say, God, lead us as a family on this faith journey? That's where we're at today. I'm, I also want to say this, guys. I'm not brainwashed. I have not been so impacted by, the, by the, the news and the media and all those other platforms that I'm coming at you from that. I'm not, I'm not coming at you solely from experiences that I have, although I may share some of those. I, it is my job today to communicate to you as what the Lord is leading us to. Amen? That's why I'm here, and I hope that's why you are here. Nevertheless... This is a very, very, very real time of racial tension. Division is at, a, I don't know if I can say an all-time high, but in my life I feel like it's kind of surging towards that. Um, I don't know that I've ever experienced anything, anything like it. So this is what I find as I talk to people, and I talk to a lot of people. Um, I find that people are approaching this similar to the way they approach the corona or the COVID-19. It's like some people... And, and, and I'm not trying to offend anyone with this. I, let me just say this. It's not my intentions to offend anyone that God doesn't want you to be upset. You know, God, sometimes God makes me very upset. But that's, I've learned that that's kind of an issue that he's trying to lead me out of and through. Amen? Amen? But some people approach this topic of racism similar to what I experience people are approaching the coronavirus. Some people's like, like, it's not real. Don't even exist. It's a government conspiracy. It ain't nothing. It's just a bunch of hoopla. They're trying to motivate and try to steer. It's, it's, it's unreal. It's not even real. And then there's a person on the, maybe I'll say the other end of that spectrum. This person, like, we haven't even seen them because they almost ceased to exist. They, they dug a hole somewhere almost like, and they, they buried up in this storm shelter kind of a thing, and they don't even want to pop their head up out of the ground anymore because they are so convinced and terrified that this thing is like the, a plague that's going to sweep across and wipe everybody out. Opposite ends of the spectrum here. 
And I find the same thing when we start talking about racism. Some people are like, it don't exist. That's, that's an old thing. It's not even real. And other people, unfortunately, are somewhat like what we see today. They respond out of that racism with acts of violence and, and hatred and evil. So I want to go ahead and let everyone know right here that what I'm going to talk about today, although it, uh, it can be easily connected to some of what we see with these violent protests, I 100%, without shame, I'm looking into the camera, I condemn it from day one to any time. There is absolutely no excuse for anyone to go and destroy innocent people's property and things like that all in the name of justice. That's not justice, okay? That is hatred, that is evil, that is, Im at the very best, it's immaturity. I condemn it. And this is what I find, that most of my brothers and sisters that are also, that, that are black, they also condemn it. They don't condone it. There is an evil out there. There is. We have a great enemy. And we as followers of Christ, we should be the first ones to acknowledge that, that it does exist. The Bible says that there's spiritual wickedness in high places. There's some things, there's some powers that's stirring things that's going on and it's dripping down into the lives of people. But they, people, are not our enemies. That can be easily, easily done, but they're not our enemies. So um, racial tension and division is it's nothing new. And I'm going to show you that through the scripture. But it's still very difficult to identify. The other day, my wife and I were, uh, were driving through Natchez. We'd come out of Morgantown, and we're going back through downtown to get back to the bridge. And I'm, I'm driving. She's over there in the, you know, riding shotgun. A couple of kids in the back. I don't remember which one it was. It, when you got as many as we have, you, you, you kind of lose track of that kind of stuff. But uh, we're just riding. I'm just doing what I usually do. I'm kind of, you know, aware of what's going on. I'm in a conversation. I'm having a great time. And my wife is doing what she does. She's incredibly alert, paying attention to everything. And all of a sudden, she goes, look out! And I, that draws my attention to this truck that's right beside me. And, and I see that he's fixing to turn right in front of me, come all the way from the right lane, all the way across. So I get on a horn while I'm moving over. And he sees me. He pulls back into his lane. I go past him. And guess what I did when I passed him? exactly what I did because I've done that to people so many times some of y'all thought I flipped him bird didn't you that's that's the old me <laughs> that's that's the before Christ me all right yeah the old Beverly Hillbilly salute now now I waved because uh, because I can really empathize with that person you see the, the thing was I was in his blind spot and that's what I told my wife. But this is what's interesting. I was in his blind spot, which means, you know, he couldn't really see me out of a side mirror. He couldn't see me out of a rearview mirror. And he didn't turn his head to look like we're told we should do. I was in his blind spot, but I also had a blind spot. And had my wife not been sitting there to bring my attention to my blind spot, there would have been a, there would have been a collision. We need people in our lives that will help us with our blind spots. How many of y'all need somebody like that in your life? I need people. I have blind spots. Guys, this topic of racism is one that can fly under the radar of our hearts. It's one that we can, that we can skim through life not really, really realizing how deeply ingrained it is and how much it really does exist. And sometimes we need people like Jesus does for this guy to come along and say, Look out! This is a part of it. Let me bring your attention to it so you can deal with it. Y'all look at somebody and say, Be part of the solution. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. We know this as the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesse, did you tell somebody you did? I'm so proud of you. So proud. Corey, did you get left out? Be part of the solution, Corey. <laughs> I just love that Jesse walked in and I got to just tell her to go all the way to the front. I just love that. Good job, Mama. <laughs> Let's see how Jesus handled this. Let's see how Jesus brought somebody's attention to something that was a part of what we would call a blind spot in their life. One day, an expert, I told you a while ago I wasn't, but this guy is identified as an expert, and guess what? An expert in religious law. Woo! Say, Big Daddy, top, big cheese right here. Just who Jesus is talking to. He comes to him, and he stood up to test Jesus. Can I just say that that's, already, that's always a bad start to your day? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up and test Jesus. That's what this guy does, and he does it by asking him a question. He says, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus has a response. And as a good leader, Jesus shows us how you really lead people. You don't just answer their questions. 
with a, with a simple answer, you let them answer their question. So that's what Jesus does. He replies with a question. He says, well, what does the law of Moses say, and how do you read it? So the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. I can almost see this guy in arrogance just quoting this scripture that comes out of the old Deuteronomy, the old law. Just love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But notice how Jesus responds. He said, right, do this and you will live. The guy already, he was able to communicate to him verbally the answer to his question. But this man had a disease that most of us have. He wanted to justify where he was at. And that's what the scripture says. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, all right, and who is my neighbor? So, Again, in his classic way of answering and leading, Jesus presents a story, a parable, something that we can relate to, similar to almost wrecking uh, going down the highway because we have blind spots. You can understand that, but we don't always understand the spiritual blind spots that we have. That was a mini parable. This is Jesus' big parable that's going to answer the question. This it says, uh, he tells him a story. He says, there was a Jewish man. He was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, now, a little bit of context here. The guy he was talking to that was the religious expert is a Jew. And there's one class of people that he just cannot stand. So take just a minute and think about that class of people or that ethnicity, if I said that correctly, that, that certain nationality or uh, if we're going to just say it, you know, that certain skin color that you just find yourself at times having very little patience with or not much tolerance or uh, we just really can't stand them. Jesus just mentioned that guy. It says there was a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, left him half dead beside the road and by chance a priest came along. So a priest would have been a part of this Jewish religious culture. A priest came along but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed over to the other side of the road, passed him by. And then the second person comes, a temple assistant. Walked over, looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. And here is that despised person. I love that Jesus actually calls him that in verse 33. Then a despised Samaritan. <sighs> of all the people. A despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, look at his response. He felt compassion for him. Jesus completes this story by telling of the actions that that compassion brought about. It says that he went over to him. The Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. He put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. And the next day, it says he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill is any higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, and then Jesus asked this Jewish religious expert. He asked him a question. He says, now which of these three, remember, we had a priest, a temple assistant, and a despised Samaritan. He said, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? In verse 37, the man replied, the one who showed him Amen. mercy. And Jesus says, yes, Amen. now go and do the same. Amen. That's Jesus' words to us today. Amen. Be part of the solution. Don't just see and walk away. Don't just notice and be silent. Be part of the solution. There's an expert here, as Jesus denoted for us. And this story is Jesus' way of answering this expert's question. And what it does is help us to realize that there are times when we can have things in our mind that haven't really made it to our heart. We can say the right things even when we don't necessarily feel them. And Jesus the lover of our soul, the one who gave his life so that we could be free, looks into the heart of this man and helps him to see what he can see. He kind of blows the horn and says, look out. 
there's something in there that you need to be aware of. Why would Jesus do such a thing? Because he cares more for our eternity than he cares for our feelings. He wants to spend all of eternity with us, even if it's a little bit of a tension in the here and now. Well worth it, just like a good parent will do with their children. They'll say, okay, a little bit of discipline here will save a whole lot of heartache there. All right? All right, so that's what's going on. The story is Jesus' way of answering his question, who is my neighbor? The Jewish person like you, he says to this man, was victimized. He was attacked, beaten, robbed, left for dead. And then people that should love you, people that should care for you, people that should stand up for you, people that should put their life on hold to meet your needs, kept walking. One of them even walked over and looked at you and went on about their way. Guys, I don't want to get into this super deep with you right now, but I just want to present to you for a moment that in a similar way, that's what we have been doing in our country now for years. We've been noticing some things that are unjust taking place. We've been noticing and seeing and hearing about and able to watch some things that are happening that you just can't justify. You just can't call it right. But the real question is this. What are we going to do? And why have we been doing what we have done? Maybe I should say it like this. Why have we not done things that we should do? Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? We talk about the Good Samaritan in this story, but we skip over the two, the temple priest and the temple assistant. We skip over them. But that's really where the focus needs to be for this day and age. If we're really to bring about unity, if we are to be the one that Jesus came, bled, died for, we must consider the two that walked away and allow God to do his work in our lives. This is a very complicated, it is a very difficult situation. But it is one that we have the evidence that it is undeniable. Amen. It is happening. Amen. Will we deal with it? Guys, I have studied this week about things that I have up to this point in my life. Honestly, a couple of them concepts I've never even entertained a thought of. I've never really dove into what would be what people, I think what people call now today's systematic or systemic racism and what that looks like. I've never really tried to take a second glance at white privilege. And I'm not going to get into all the reasons. I'm just going to tell you this. I have spent a lot of my years in a very spiritually unhealthy place. I was raised in a culture that really, really cultivated racism. And when I think about white privilege today, I'm reminded of what happened the other day when I was walking around Walmart with my kid, two of my kids. No, actually it was one, just, just Jude and I. <laughs> I. I told you, it gets confusing. No, I got five, okay. Um, Jude, me and Jude were walking around, and uh, this dude is, I don't know what he's going to turn out to be, uh, but he's, gonna, he's, he's, he's bound to be something pretty, mm, I don't know. But anyway, because he's always asking these crazy questions. And he, and he asked me, uh, first he asked me about the cereal. And he's like, can I get cereal today? He's like, no, we're not getting cereal today, man. He's like, you realize if you wouldn't have started that stupid exercise routine, I'd be leaving here with cereal today. I was like, yeah, good point. Still not getting cereal. But then he said this. He asked for a couple other things. And I was like, sure, man, you can have it. And I asked for something else. I said, sure, you can get it. And he, this is what he told me. He said, Daddy, I like when Eden's not here. So for those of you that don't know, Eden is my youngest child. And he said, I like when Eden's not here because I get to be Eden. <laughs> and I said, and just tell me, what is Eden? He said, Eden gets whatever Eden wants. <laughs> I don't really feel that way. Even though last night at 930 when I was trying to go to bed, she crawled up in our lap and she said, Daddy, I'm hungry. I said, what you want to eat, baby? <laughs> I was reminded of Jews' conversation. This is why I tell y'all this. Eden does not realize what a privileged state she lives in because she's always been there. 
And I think in some ways that's how it is with me. I don't really know what it's like to not live in the privileged state that I've always lived in. I don't. But I'll tell you what I've learned this week. Through a couple of conversations, I have been awakened to some things that I had not ever considered. Things that have been there. But I just, for whatever the reason, have not sat down and had those conversations. Very interesting. Trust me when I say we don't have time to go into it now. But again, I've never really thought about it. And when we, when we, when we lean into what Jesus is leading us towards, then these things begin to surface. And there's, there is a solution but the solution is not going to come easy. There is some pain involved. Amen. Another example with my children. I, I might start paying my kids whenever they give me sermon illustrations. But this is, what, this is what happened the other day. My oldest son, Eli, has really, really stepped up and bailed us out in our business over this summer. And he's been working really hard to help fill in some slots and some gaps there. Um, and we were just at the shop the other day, and Eli was walking around, and this is what he was doing. He was going, <laughs> and, man, I was taken back to where I was at that age because allergies used to give me the fits. And I was sitting there, and I was thinking, I said, son, the honey's on the counter. So the story behind that is, for those of, for those of you that know that I, I, I sell honey. I got into beekeeping because I watched my dad, all of my young adult life, all of my young life, I watched my dad go through all these allergy treatments and stuff, and none of it ever worked. So I'm not a doctor. I'm not an expert. Or anything, but I, I was just thinking, I know what don't work. And I know what hadn't worked for him. I'm not going down that road. I'm not going to do the pills and the shots and the surgeries because it hadn't worked for him. I'm going to just tough it out. Maybe my body will just somehow, some way, you know, develop some kind of a cure, I don't know, you know, get strong or whatever. And then I kept hearing local honey, local honey, local honey, local honey. So I was like, I'm going to try it. Then I started getting into the honey business. I figured out, you know, that mo uh, not all local honey is really organically grown. It's got some crazy stuff put in it. So I decided, you know what, I'll just try it myself. And I fell in love with these thousands of ladies. That's what I call them, you know. We got about 15 to 20 hives, and every one of them will contain about 50 to 60,000 workers in there, you know, and I just love hanging out with them. One reason I love it is because they just always just do what they're supposed to do. Amen? Don't you need things like that in your life? You can go out there, and they're just doing what they're supposed to do. Pretty therapeutic. I started eating this honey, and I don't have issues no more. Like, I can go out there, and I can bush haul goldenrod, and it don't even affect me no more. So I'm looking at my son, and literally right in front of him, we have this display set up with our organic honey. And I said, you just ain't, you just ain't hurt long enough yet. Just keep hurting. You'll get to the point where you'll be like, a teaspoon a day ain't that big a deal. And I feel like that's the same heart I have when I see people struggling with racism. The cure is right there. For me, it happened through a black pastor years ago. His name was Reverend L.B. Oliver. That's what we called him. He was the man that when my wife and I decided it was time for us to, to plant a church, I wasn't sure if I was going to share this, but I'm going to share it. One of the reasons, one of the motivating factors for my wife and I to finally step out on our own and say, we're, we're, we're moving out. We don't know where we're headed, but we're moving out. One of the things that had happened in that season of us ministering, we was trying to reach everyone. I mean, you know, when you try to reach everyone, you're going you're gonna to get some people that are, some people don't like. And we was ministering to, to people regardless of what their skin tone was. And we were just trying to bring people together. We was going to do a church with them. And word got sent to me in the late 1990s. Word got sent to me and said, if you don't stop going to those black churches, we're going to go shoot them up. And I thought, wow, dude, I thought this stuff died a long time ago. But it was a part of the reality. So when my wife and I decided to take that step, this, this black pastor come to me and he said, hey, use our building. For two years, for those of you who don't know, for two years we met in a little church building that was owned by a black congregation. And that man told me something one night. He said, Jerry, there's going to be times in your life when God's going to wake you up. 
in the middle of the night, early in the morning, or late night, he's going to wake you up. And, and when, you, when that happens, get on up out of the bed. He said, tell me like this. He said, wash your face, brush your teeth, and put on some good clothes and go outside. Sit down in a chair or whatever you want to do and just say, all right, God, here I am. Speak to me. I woke up one night, and it was just heavy on my heart, this sin of racism that resided within me. I tried to slick it up. I tried to make it look good, and I tried to sugarcoat it, and I tried to cover it up. But it was just, whoo, man, it was strong. So I got up, and I brushed my teeth, and I wiped my face off, and I put on some clothes, and I went out there, and I built me a little fire, and I sat in that chair, and I said, here I am, God. Three o'clock in the morning, I don't think I'll ever forget it. I said, here I am. I've been trying to deal with this, but I can't fix it. I need you to do it, guys. And, and it was like God poured a warm oil over me. I'll never forget it. I went out there this morning at 5 o'clock before I come here, and I got on my, actually, I didn't get on my knees. I just squatted down on my heels right there, and I just wanted to be back in that little area where God done for me what he wants to do for all of us. Now, I told you in the beginning, I'm going to tell you again. Does that mean that I have completely arrived? No, I'm kind of like an old car, you know. It's, it's going to take some work. You know, it ain't a, it ain't a one-day restoration. But I knew that I had taken some big steps years after that when God blessed us with children. And I was going, as, I'm, I'm picking on you today, Eli. You know, I'm not going to apologize because I'm really not doing it on purpose. But I'm, I'm, uh, I went to my son, and he helped me to realize something. We were saying our nighttime prayers. I'll never forget him. Beautiful little kid. He always has been. His little, little brown skin, his brown eyes looking at me with such purity. Uh, we got through praying, and he said, Daddy, you're not going to ask God to forgive you? <laughs> Man, what did he see? I said, for what, son? He said, because you, you said a cuss word. I said, what did I say? He said, you said the N word. And I had not said that word. And I was, I was telling some people one of the jokes that I used to tell. This is, a, this is something I'm not proud of. But for a season in my life as a young man, I was, like the, I was like redneck entertainment. I was the one that could just reel them jokes off, man, one after another. And I was sharing a joke with someone. My son, I don't think, realized that I, he just heard me say that word. So he brought it back to my attention. And I knew then. That from, from where I was <laughs> before Christ, from where I was as, as a parent in my home, that for my son to, to, to consider that a word of profanity, Amen. that God was doing something. Amen. Amen. And I'm just here today to kind of, look out. Let me, let me, let me raise your, let me, let me draw your attention to something that might be a part of your life. You might be like I was for years. You may not be, a, you, you may not be aware of it. Or you might be trying to suppress it. You might be trying to do some behavioral modifications. But let me just tell you guys, there is true salvation. Amen. There is redemption. That's why Jesus was praying that prayer, and he's praying that prayer for us today. Jesus in us, loving our fellow man, that is the solution. Let's be part of the solution. There is grace. And it is real. And God is ready. We have to make a choice. I'm going to give you four real quick steps that I think you can take that will help you. We're going to get practical for a moment, and then we're going to give you an opportunity to respond how the Lord leads you. Four practical steps. Number one, you need to raise your self-awareness. This is where we do a heart check. I've alluded to this a couple of times throughout this message. Let me just be a little bit more direct and speak very specifically into one way you can know. If while you're out and about, you're just hanging out with friends, you're out in the public or whatever the case is, maybe you're surfing on some social media platforms or maybe you're listening to some music, maybe you're watching television. If you feel this little weird feeling in your heart when a, certain, when a person of a certain color comes across your screen, that could be an indication that there's a hint of racism there. I'm trying to be as polite as I can here. That could be an indication. And it doesn't necessarily have to be someone that's black. It can be someone that's white. It can be someone that's brown. I was super encouraged this morning to receive a, 
uh, a word of encouragement from one of my dear friends that is a pastor down in Dominican Republic, uh, Pastor Jira. She sent me a message this morning. She said, Pastor Jira, I just woke up this morning, and you was really heavy on my heart, and I began to pray for you. And she mentioned three areas that she were praying very specifically, and the message today was one of them. No, I haven't let her, I haven't let anybody know. Until last night, I didn't talk to my wife hardly about this. But it was just so encouraging. And here she is. So if you run across someone and you feel this weird feeling, that might be an indication where you need to own it. I've got some other things that you can do. I was talking to my dear brother and friend. Kevin Skipper this morning and before we even really got going on things he said man I, I just got through with this Bible plan on the Version Bible app and it has turned out to be one of my most favorite the, the name of that plan is how to love people you disagree with how to love people you disagree with and he looked at me and he said I thought about you pastor <laughs> now let me just say this if you don't have people in your life that will love you enough to come to you and say, hey, man, I love you, but I disagree with, what you, with where you're at with that. Can I just tell you that after the 9 o'clock service, I sit right out there on that front porch and had an incredible conversation with a person that come to me about something that was said, and they said, I think we, I think we, we disagree here. But it was a, a, a powerful conversation. And it was one that after the conversation, I felt even closer to this person. Because I know now that I can trust this person that they're going to bring something to me. Amen. They're not going to go tell everybody else and disagree on all those other ways. They're going to bring it to me. And, and this is what we discovered after we talked it out. We're, we're actually on the same page. So that's one Bible plan. How to love people you disagree with. Another one is overcoming. These were put out by Life Church. Uh, for this specific season that we're in right now, The Power of Unity by Tony Evans, Be the Bridge by Latasha Morrison. I'll leave this list laying up here for those of you that want to come check it out. And this last one really resonated with me because I'd done this one last year uh, during the season when we were honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His daughter done this plan. Her name is Bernie, Dr. Bernice A. King, cultivating a heart of mercy. This is what it done for me. It raised my awareness to situations that still happened that I did not know. I did not know. I mean, it, it should be obvious. Can I, can I just be real for a moment? Look around. Look around. The one hour of the week where we should most be together. Look around. We got some work to do. We got some work to do. Number two. Take control and responsibility of your heart. Take responsibility of your heart. Take control of your heart. How, how can you, here's a quick litmus test to, to kind of let you know where you're at on this whole issue. I, I, Bill Harrell, one of my dear friends, closest friends and dear brother, that God worked incredibly powerfully through to lead me to himself. He told me this years ago. He said, man, you don't have to tell me anything about yourself. Just let me hang out with your kids. I'm going, to tell, I'm going to use that same philosophy to tell you that if you want to see how you really are about people of a different color, as parents, all you got to do is watch the way your children treat people. This is a funny one for you, and I hope you uh, accept it as that. I know how y'all feel about me by the way your kids treat me. <laughs> I know when you don't agree with the sermon and you go home and you, what's it called, a home roasting? Whenever you go home and you cook the preacher, I know because of the way your kids treat me after that. Because this is a reality. I'm, I'm about as immature as most of them. I'm just a kid at heart. And I, I, I like your kids and most of them like me. So when, they come to, when I get to hang out with them and they like can't look me in the eyes and they like, oh, crazy. They, they, they just got this war going on. It's like my mama and my daddy said this, but golly, I like, the, I like this guy. But they, they said this, you know. And in the same way, we can use that as a test to see where we are with what we have cultivated in our homes in these areas. How do our children treat different people? Take control, take responsibility of your heart. You see the issue, deal with the issue. Number three, and this is a huge one. This is a big one. This is incredibly practical. Plan and have a conversation. All of us have people in our lives that are of a different nationality, they're of a different group, you know, they're a different color. We all have those people. Amen. Find that person, 
and have the conversation. I'm just going to give you the first question. Just say like this. Say, I don't know what it's like to be you. Can you just tell me? And then listen. I don't, I don't know. I, I, want to, I want to understand. Can you just talk to me? Plan and have a conversation. And the last one is, is where we always begin and it's where we always end, and that is simply this. Pray. Amen. Pray. That's what we're going to do here in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to ask God to do what only he can do. And I'm going to turn it back over to you for your response. But let me just say this, guys. I believe that in the midst of this darkness, God is calling us to be the light that is going to eliminate, Amen. that is going to bring revival. Amen. And it very well may start right here. Amen. Be a part of the solution. Y'all stand with me. Be part of the solution. Let's pray as the team comes forward. Father, we study your word and we see very clearly what your vision is. And we're trying to follow you, Jesus. The word says that we are to be like you, that we were, we were formed and created and are being transformed, renewed day by day to be more like you. And this, this concept of unity that seems at times like it's just too far. It's, it's unattainable. It, 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 at times it seems like there's no hope. Jesus, you are praying for this. You were praying for this when you were here. You're praying for this now. You're giving us the blessings of your presence to empower us to be these people that are one from all across the world. To be the Good Samaritan. To treat everyone as a neighbor should, to be kind, to be compassionate, to do what we're able to do, but to never just turn and walk away, to never choose silence because it's easier. Bless us, I pray, Father. And, and specifically right now, as David prayed, God, search us, search our hearts, see if there's any wicked way in us, God, and show us so that you might remove it and regenerate us and, and give us freedom. That's what your word says, that there's freedom where the Spirit of the Lord is. God, we want that freedom. Bless us, Father. Help us to take steps. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. It'll never be easy. And if you're waiting for the time when you have all the words and you got it all figured out, can I just go ahead and tell you that that time will never come. When we launched this church, this was the, the reporter came and interviewed me. He said, Jerry, tell us about this church. What's it going to be like? And I was so happy and so proud in that day to, to share these words that I now look back on and I say, geez, I could have said that better. But this is what I said. I said, we're just a bunch of colorblind, mixed bread mutts trying to serve Jesus. I felt so good about it, but now I'm learning that we're not colorblind. We're just, we're choosing to embrace the beauty of the variety of God's creation. Amen. We recognize people of all shades, shapes, colors, and fashions as human beings as fellow heirs of the promise of God. So, just like I look back and say, I wish I would have said that differently, whatever I said today, I will very likely look back on in the future and say, I wish I would have said it differently, but that's the process. So I'm just trying to encourage you, speak 